uh, of course, the influence of the social networks, yes. the visual distractions, the so many uh, TV shows and films and videos offered, even Facebook Reels, those uh, addictive yes, very uh, videos, short. very short but very addictive, uh, that they are taking away for the chance to read a book. Aj takto bude znieť podcast katedry anglistiky a amerikanistiky UKF Nitre. So welcome to all of our listeners. Today I'm talking to a very special guest from Mexico, Professor Luis Alberto Perez Amesqua, who spent a couple of days with us so far and who's going to be here for the next week. So welcome to our podcast. We will start with a general introduction. So tell us something about where you are from, what your hobbies are, what are the basics that our students should know about you? Well, I'm from Mexico. I was born in a city called Guadalajara. It's uh, close to the Pacific Ocean. It's in the western part of the country. And uh, I have lived and studied literature in the capital of the state of Jalisco and at the University of Guadalajara. And now I work for the University of Guadalajara. My PhD was in, a, in another university in Mexico City called Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana. And it was in the humanities with a focus on literary theory. So I like literary theory. And right now uh, I'm uh, researching on the theory of the imaginary and particularly myth criticism. And how is that experience working for the same university where you studied? Was that a coincidence or did you always want to teach there as well? I always wanted to teach there. Uh, But I didn't expect it that because in Guadalajara we have the program I teach at that is uh, Letras Hispanicas, like Hispanic literature. But it's so crowded, so many good teachers and professors there. So I thought it was going to be impossible for me to get a position there. But then uh, they opened the program in a different campus of the university because we are a huge university. Almost 300,000 students go every day to school in different parts of the state of Jalisco, but it's still part of University of Guadalajara. So they opened the program in the University Center of the South, and I have been working there since 2015. So this year would be will be my eighth year working there, and I'm very happy. We are a very, very small program. In Guadalajara, they receive around 120 stud students per, per year, and we only receive 25 or 30 if we are lucky. It's a very comfortable group to work with. You can pay more attention to them. You can get to know them better. So yeah, I'm very happy living there. Also, it's a small city. I live in a city called Ciudad Guzmán, or Zapotlán, which is the traditional name. And since it's a small city of 150,000 inhabitants compared to Guadalajara, which is almost 5 million, I'm blessed. Mm -hmm. So it is quite similar to what we have here in Nitra, right? So the groups that you worked with here are kind of similar to what you have to deal with at home. Yeah, and I have found that they, the students are basically the same, <laughs> sometimes shy at the beginning, then there's one or two that connect better with what you are talking about. So they participate more, they are more engaged, and but they are curious. They want to know things, different things. I don't know if I always deliver the way I want to, but I try to, to find those interests in them and to try to uh, establish communication and dialogues with them. I think it's a problem that all teachers have, that you have to kind of have that experience to know what works, what doesn't work, maybe change some things a little bit. So it's, I think, a universal teacher experience. It's our language, basically. Yeah, yeah. And uh, of course, the influence of the social networks, yes. the visual distractions, the so many 
uh, TV shows and films and videos offer, even Facebook Reels, those uh, addictive yes, uh, very videos, short. very short but very addictive, um, that they are taking away for the chance to read a book, by example, 500 uh, pages. So we are fighting against that. And the challenge is how are we now going to teach? How are we going to let them learn and to discover the pleasure of reading, which I still believe is uh, one of the best ways to know something or somebody even uh, profoundly, you know? So I didn't think about that question before, but now that you are talking about it, it's an interesting topic. So do you have any strategies that you've tried out in your at your university that work? Uh, in terms of reading or promoting reading? Is it a challenge, really? It is, because I'm very old-fashioned. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, I find pleasure um, writing a book down, taking notes there, even making draws. We were talking about yes. it the day we met, the day before. And uh, uh, it's very difficult for me to find other instruments different than the books that the direct text, the original words of authors to communicate, mm -hmm. specifically literature, you know? And it is also a challenge for me in the course I, I, I teach literary theory, it's very difficult for them. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, the uh, abstract thinking is not very easy to find in, in a student. And also I have to say, we have very, very bad educational system since the beginning, you know, since the primary or secondary school, we uh, experience difficulties teaching the kids how to think critically. So when they arrived to the university program, and you have to fight that also. So you have to solve problems that you shouldn't be uh, facing, right? That should already be solved by that yeah, time, yes. Theoretically. So if I may go back to your university a little bit, you've mentioned that it spread out throughout the city and uh, you have many buildings and a rich history as well. So could you tell us something about uh, its history? Yeah, um, well, in Mexico, you can say that we were lucky because after the Spanish conquest, the friars and religious people who arrived to, to the, the, now the country, the, then the continent, established university very soon, first in Mexico City, and then in Guadalajara, or the state of Jalisco, in which Guadalajara uh, is. It was, uh, uh, there's an antecedent of 1591, the end of the uh, very 16th century. But the modern university, we can say it was founded in 1791. This is the end of the 18th century. And uh, uh, after different political wars and political difficulties we experienced in Mexico, the modern university of Guadalajara was founded in 1925. So we are going to celebrate one century of its modern foundation. And I think one of the th interesting things about the university is that it's one of the it's one of the biggest in the country. I mean, there is the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, which is the best and the biggest because they are all, even older. But uh, we are the only university uh, that has this university network. So we work in different parts of the state. So the students don't need to go to the capital. So now it's somehow decentralized and it's easier for them to study. Let's talk about your other visit to Slovakia. I don't know specifically how many times have you been here, uh, but I know of at least one time uh, that you were a guest professor, right, in Bratislava at one of our other universities. So how was that experience? It was great because it happened thanks to the intervention of one uh, student from Slovakia that actually spent a semester in my university. Mm -hmm. uh, one time I received an email from Maria Cervenova and she said that she wanted to go and uh, study a semester there. 
So she was asking for help. And I said, of course, it would be great to have you here. It would be nice for other for the mm -hmm. other students to to meet you, someone from Slovakia, from another continent, another country. So come. She stayed there for a couple of weeks uh, at home. Uh, meanwhile, she uh, found a place to, to live with students because I, I, I was, uh, of course, uh, offering her to stay at home as much as she wanted. But I also wanted her to live with students not with professors like have that experience yeah. mm -hmm. so uh, she was there and when she knew that I was around in Europe I came here for a conference or something I can remember that was like four years ago mm -hmm. and she said why don't you come and and speak to the students of the the, the, the Spanish program about whatever you like and I said of course sure I, I, I would be I will be happy and uh, I talked to them about contemporary Mexican literature and the experience was uh, amazing because since that first visit to Slovakia I felt uh, myself welcomed and I was able to able to meet uh, Maria's mom and she was very thankful to me because mm. we took care of her daughter you know and now it feels like feels like family mm. actually I'm going to meet them tonight for dinner they also invite a nice they reunion are, yeah they are coming to 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 visit which I find uh, really nice and uh yeah i was thinking in the morning that it's strange how things happen sometimes because if you would ask me five years ago or i don't know are you planning to go to slovakia we said <laughs> no uh, I, I i wasn't thinking about it but now it happened twice like a miracle in bratislava it was only for a couple of nights it wasn't uh, enough to get to know the country or even the city uh, in the right form so now i'm very happy and i find nitro amazing because it's quiet ordered peaceful uh, with lots of treats trees and nature and uh yeah i'm i love being here so overall your experience so far was very pleasant yeah but to be honest and and it's something i wanted to to share i was a little bit afraid because of the language of the english language mm. Uh, I don't speak it normally at home on, or, or on a daily basis. I don't teach in English. I studied English by myself. So that combined with the lack, the lack of practice combined with the nerves of being in front of students from a mm, different country, yes. from a different university, was a little bit scary. But uh, I am getting more comfortable every day. Uh, as Until now, I have had three presentations one on an anime TV show called Blood of Zeus, which is on Netflix, mm -hmm. and it really elaborates the myth of Heracles. Today I talked about another myth, the myth of Medusa, in different uh, cultural products, such as um, movies and uh, a musical clip. And yesterday, with the students of Spanish, I talked about, I talked about um, Mexican literature, mm -hmm. and I hope they like it. So, I'm sure at least to, yes. at least to some of them, and uh, I hoped I uh, pro pro produce or provoke this curiosity to know more about not only Mexico or Mexican literature, but also of the productivity of studying in myth in our very popular culture. As I've said, I'm sure they liked it. It is always nice to hear something about the different culture, different types of literature, different works and so on. So what is your schedule like for the coming days? So counting this week and next week as well. Yeah, there's uh, a couple of presentations left, one tomorrow, one the next week. And uh, I will meet uh, Professor Magda for lunch today. And it's very interesting for me because she was in Mexico for a couple of days. And I really want to meet her and to know her impressions and to also invite her formally to mm -hmm. go to Guadalajara, University of Guadalajara, to talk with our students. And is there anything specific that you would like to see or nothing specific planned, but you just want to kind of explore? Well, I'm a, a museum guy. I can spend the, a whole day in a museum or two, of, right? So I am looking forward for museums, but I would also lo love to visit, I don't know the name of the hill, the place that have like a mm, Calvary. chapel. Calvary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am not very sportive, but <laughs> I'll do my best to, to be there. I always like the views 
of the city, of the city, cities in, in general. Uh, but yeah, I would love to know more about Nitras and Slovakia history and culture and art. I think that's something missing until right now. I would uh, love to find someone to guide me. Uh, I will I probably will get lucky in the next days. And how did this interest in museums come about? When I was in eighth grade secondary school, I met a friend that he and he was studying sculpture. So he started lending me books of art history or of different painters like Dali or Van Gogh or stuff. So that's when my interest in art and in, in art history began. I was kind of atypical mm -hmm. for Mexican kids, to be honest. And then some, sometimes I have talked art history or art appreciation So when I get the chance to visit a museum and to be uh, in front of the original piece that I have only seen online or in, in books, it really it's really moving for me, you know? Uh, sometimes I have felt goosebumps when finally arriving to see uh, an artwork. So that's why I'm a museum guy. So let's talk about your academic background a little bit more. You've mentioned a few things that you are interested in, for example, books, movies. You even said that you were trying to get into video games. So based on this, I would say that you are interested in a little bit of everything. Is that a fair assumption? I think it's not. It's probably confusing. <laughs> I don't know. But my basic lines of research is Mexican literature because my master's was in Mexican literature studies. Uh, so that's a line. But when I... Uh, I started my PhD. I focus on myth criticism applied to Mexican literature. So sometimes, uh, somehow, it's related. And that's the other thing I, I, I'm interested in, how myth can be used to teach something. I have presented recently a research project to the national institution in Mexico in charge of funding research. And I am trying to explore how myth can be used with kids from nine to 11 years, primary schools. And the, the idea is to work with them and to promote the culture of peace and tolerance with the kids, you know, because in Mexico, we are living in terrible moments uh, in everything related with security and peace and tolerance. So we are trying to help them to get in touch with reading, with books, according to their age, of course. And to, uh, on the other side, we want this power of myths, the, the power of myths to be that moving that can make a difference in their formation. Let's see what happens. But that's my, my project, the, the project I have in mind. But the other one is just to study Uh, what the junk people or well just the, the people actually consumes in, in what we consume or well, I can include myself myself because because uh, I grew up seeing a lot of things related to popular culture too the influence of Uni the United States the cultural industries of the United States is very strong so movies TV shows Uh, all of them basically come from the United States popular culture. So what's the ideology behind it and how meat has been related with the ideology? Uh, so if uh, our young people consume TV shows, let's study TV shows, what they are receiving, what they are getting, what are they are being fed off and what are they selling them? So we need to critically think about it, to try to prevent something we don't want, or to alert, that's I think one of the functions of the academia. We need to at least show what these kind of products are doing in the minds of our young people. So in general, you deal with similar topics, but in various media, books, video games, TV shows, movies, and so on. It's great that you ask it because I always try to study something that was first in the shape of a book, 
your, something written, then how it is translated to other media like films or TV shows or even video games. A very simple example is God of War. And you can look in different cities, big spectaculars saying God of new the new release of God of War's video games are going to be released on that date. And everybody's expecting that. But I don't I don't want to miss my literary origins uh, because I think also the artistic quality, the artistic origin of a, a story uh, has to be preserved and also, um, I don't know how to say it, uh, still promoted. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. We have this TV show, but don't forget that it is based on this novel. So, okay, you go ahead and watch and enjoy the TV show, but go, go and read the book. It's also good. You compare and you find the differences by yourself and then decide whether if you like more the book or the teacher, well, I don't care, but do experience it, you know? By example, I recently uh, read or reread uh, a novel but, uh, by a novelist, Mexican novelist called Bernardo Esquinca, and the novel is called Toda la Sangre, like all, all the blood or something like that. And it was recently adapted into a TV show called the same, anonymous, you know, it has an anonymous title, Toda la Sangre, All the Blood. And it, it is very interesting because in the in the book you you can find a male male detective, but in the TV show is a female detective, and it's very strange because imagining a police woman in Mexico's corrupt police system is crazy. Okay, and it really interests me because it deploys the myth of a goddess called that Chalchutlique. And uh, it's like uh, a goddess who requires blood. Her Aztec uh, culture was also known for its sacrifices and the taking the hearts away and stuff, a very bloody mm. thing. A and in this story, there's a serial killer uh, um, re uh, reenacting some of the Aztec sacrifice to the all gods. And the idea is that the all Mexican Aztec gods are going to come back and the culture is going to change because they were hidden, they were forgotten, but now they are going to re retake power and change Mexico. It's a crazy thing. So we have there the two media, the book and the TV show, and I hope to explore it soon. That mm -hmm. it is also important how the cultural industries help to show or to recover different cultural and mythical traditions. Mm -hmm. By example, Netflix created another TV show. It's called Diablero, like something like a demon killer, something mm -hmm. like that. And it has lots of uh, mythical uh, things. Uh, and it is based on something that I have called the Diablero universe because it's not only the TV show, but also uh, 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 graphic novels mm -hmm. and novels written by different so All of authors. them are connected. Connected. Mm -hmm. So, so it's like we, a transmedia, basically, universe. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. We have the uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe, mm -hmm. and I have called this the Diablero universe because they created something interesting. It's not as powerful, of course, uh, because uh, it's not going to be finance or something like that. And because they made a terrible mistake in the second season of Diablero, so they closed, they canceled the show. But uh, the thing is, uh, sometimes in Netflix is producing things in different countries and regions, looking for these interesting things. So we can trace myth, myths, not only in books, but even in, in the, these big streaming companies. And since you are talking about different literary traditions, what would you say is different between the Latin American literary tradition and compared to what our students are exposed to the English or the American literary tradition? I think something similar what, of what we talked about uh, Netflix mm -hmm. happens with uh, publishing companies. So not Toronto. translating or something like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. quite some of them are or are not translated. How the markets are studied and yes, of course, uh, Latin American literature, Mexican literature, 
will probably not be that interesting for Europeans, Europe, European readers, because uh, perhaps the themes they are developing are more related to the original countries, Peru, Colombia, or Mexico, right? How many Mexican books are going to be translated into Slovak? Mm. A few, and we have a great literature. And I think, wow, why? By example, my former student, uh, Maria. Maria, please come, do you speak Spanish? Do you know Mexico? Do you know Mexican literature? Translate something into Slovak. Probably, they would probably find it interesting as we do, right? So, uh, Latin American, not only Mexican, but Latin American literature is very interesting because it's very dynamic, very uh, energetic, very powerful. It communicates things about fighting for civil rights, for LGBT communities, also fighting for their rights to live in these countries that are very traditional, very conservative. Uh, you can learn history, culture, words, and basically the spirit of a country by reading a good novel or a good piece of literature, right? So, yeah, I think it would be really interesting if we can imagine a world in which uh, now the, 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 all the books could be translated. Maybe with chat GPT, it will be easier. I don't know. So, uh, again, uh, Latin America is a very big, different paradox continent. It has different mythologies, just to put an example, since we are talking about mythology. The myths on Mexico, because we have several peoples, not only one mm -hmm. mythology, not only the Aztec, but the Maya, many languages still come, uh, live together in Mexico, but it's different than the mythology of Peru, by example, with the antecedent of the mm -hmm. Incas, or uh, the mythologies of the southern part of the continent in Chile or Ar Argentina, you know? So it's a huge tradition. Huge continent, different worlds from one uh, uh, pole to the other uh, and very active. And which ones, which kinds of mythologies or traditions are closest to you, to your personal interests, to your tastes? Of course, the Aztec mm. uh, and the Mayan, which are very related. It's interesting because even before them, even before the rise of the Aztec Empire or the Mayan Empire, there were antecedents. And we have the archaeological sites, the archaeological yeah. places to see it. So we can go and go, by example, to the pyramid of Teotihuacan. Probably, yes, the, the, probably the best known, yes. <laughs> yeah, this, this big one with Quetzalcoatl, the, mm. the feathered god. And we have many museums. So uh, I think that we can still... Uh, get in touch with that mythology very easily. So moving on to some more casual questions, what were you most looking forward to before your visit to Nitra? Or conversely, what were you most afraid of? Well, um, I was looking for this kind of nervousness, mm -hmm. of stress, mm -hmm. because I think it reminds us as teachers that something new must happen every day and that you have to prepare, that you have to study, that you have to think about who are you are, is going to listen to you. Mm -hmm. That's for, uh, that's one thing. And I was also looking for making friends with the other professors, like even like with you. Mm -hmm. I was also looking for the opportunity to perhaps someday receive the visit of one of you Mm -hmm. in, in Mexico. Unfortunately, again, the language is a difficulty, but because to be perfectly honest, in my university center, not in Guadalajara, but in Ciudad Guzmán, Zapotlán, my university center, not many of our, of our students speak even English. Mm -hmm. And that's a shame because they are losing opportunities of going abroad or stuff, or even of receiving another a conference in a different language. I am always insisting, since they are in the first course, kids, you have to learn English. You'll discover different things. It would help you in so many ways. So please do study, but they don't listen to me. And even the professors, even my colleagues, not many of them speak English. Uh, but I think things 
are changing in Europe uh, with the younger generations mm -hmm. in some of the countries I have been. Uh, basically, almost everybody, the, the young people, speak English and they can tell you, oh, go that way, go that other, or you can ask for this, or they help you, they understand you. It's, uh, but I have found, by example, that uh, some drivers, the buses, don't speak English and it's very difficult to communicate. And, and if it's difficult to communicate when you are traveling, it is also different to communicate, it's difficult to communicate when you are thinking. When you are trying to learn from other professors, other to receive other ideas, so yeah, I was hoping to make friends. So next, we asked you to recommend three essential books from your perspective, at least, to anyone hoping to learn about your country and its culture. So could you tell us what your choices are? It's a heavy thing, yes, <laughs> to carry. The word "essential" is uh, scary. Uh, <laughs> Actually, I would uh, like to recommend more than books. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, and, and I want to use the opportunity to recommend it too, especially to those who can read in, in, read Spanish, because the language of the book is not that complicated. The, the level is not that elevated. So basically, someone with a medium knowledge of Spanish uh, accompanied by a dictionary can get it. So it's a good way to enter the culture and language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at least to enter, to read a book in mm -hmm. Spanish, mm -hmm. which uh, well, sometimes it could be the beginning of a more active uh, reading career in a different language. And the book is called Las Mutaciones. I don't know if it is already translated. Las Mutaciones would, would be the muta mutations. And it's a novel about what the effects of cancer uh, are in in how it moves a uh, family and are I I could even say like an ecosystem around a person that suffers uh, cancer in Mexico uh, the statistics are saying that cancer is growing as well as uh, obesity diabetes lots of diseases and uh, we don't have good medical treatments. So it causes lots of impacts in society, and it it, it is very pretty well uh, reflected in the book, and even with a sense of humor. It's not a heavy, dramatic, moving uh, book in that sense, um, but it shows how, uh, as I said, the uh, persons around persons suffer that the mutations by Jorge Comensal. Jorge Comensal is the name. is a very young author. He's starting his career writing, and he has already three books. The one, the recent one, I haven't read that uh, yet. Uh, it's called Este Vacío Que Hierve, and it's published by Anagrama, a, a very important editorial house in the continent. So that would be my recommendation. But I would recommend three movies, three films that are based on books. Okay, they are not just the, the film, but there's also the written version of it. The first one is called in Spanish El Callejón de los Milagros. It was also called The Alley of Miracles or Midqua, Mida, Midak Ali. And it is based on a novel by uh, Nagif Mafu, Mafus. Uh, it's an Egyptian writer. It's very strange because it was the novel was very well received in Mexico. And you, you can think, what is a, an Egyptian writer doing in Mexico and having success there? Well, uh, uh, the, the book is uh, called the same in Spanish, El Callejón de los Milagros. And the book is from 1947. And in 1995, uh, they released the film. And it's interesting because it was the first performance of Salma Hayek. And it's a very good story. And uh, the second one is called Como agua para chocolate. The translation would be something like uh, light water for chocolate. And it's written by Laura, Laura Esquivel, Laura Esquivel, in 1989. And the movie, uh, I guess, uh, yeah, it's from 1992. So these are movies from the 19th, but uh, they somehow show how the Mexican film industry started to make good movies again because we had a couple of terrible decades before. 
And now, good. Then, uh, from the 90s, we started again to enjoy good movies. And the last one, uh, uh, it's curious, but the two of them uh, are uh, two of the books in which the films are based on uh, were written by women. So, female writing in Mexico is rising, and it's very important right now. And from that, that was the beginning, I think. Uh, the novel is called Arrancame la Vida, like. Uh, Take My Life Away or something like that. Tear My Life Away. It's the novel is from 1985. Uh, and the movie uh, is from 2008. Not that old, I think. But uh, you could uh, you could see there some of the more famous and best Mexican actors performing. Mm. Especially in this last one, Arrancame la Vida, you would have the chance to understand more or less how the country was politically and ideologically configured after the revolution, because in the, the revolution, revolution lasted from 1910 to 1921, and the institutions started to get uh, stronger after that, but also the corruption started to get uh, stronger, unfortunately. So it shows part of the history of Mexico, central Mexico, how the politicians uh, used to do their things, and also shows the sensibility of the uh, of the wife of this big political is uh, represented there. So that would be my recommendations. Easier to see a movie. Okay, thank you very much for these recommendations. I'm sure that it will be very interesting. At least I will try to watch them. So we included two. Uh, questions to close this section. An ultimate question was, is there any interesting memory that you will take away from your stay in Nitra? Well, uh, the other day I went out to look for something to eat at night by dinner and I saw like the landscape of the city with three different churches and the castle and it was beautiful. I was close to Promenada and uh, the sun was uh, not rising, but the opposite. Setting. Setting, so thank you. And so the colors were beautiful. And I wanted to capture there and to take it with me, not only in a picture, I took several pictures, but you know, it's one of those moments in which you say, I want to keep it with me. Yeah. And the other is curious, but uh, uh, I was walking uh, along the river and close to the university dormitory. There's a, a couple of these animals. I don't know if, in, if they are nutris or something like that. Never seen them in, in Mexico. They are like big, uh, uh, I'm, I don't know name, but they have a baby and they are hidden in a hole in the ground and the kids and their moms were feeding them and they have brown hair and, and a tail like a rat. They were swimming. They were in their home. The kid was like going out mm. and then he or she was scared and then come back to the to, to his or her house. And it, it was funny to see it. And also uh, the swans, the dogs, uh, the pigeons. There was uh, an old guy feeding pigeons lo with lots of bread for them. And they were eating from his hands and all around his shoulders. And it was like an, a very beautiful moment to see how persons, how people can uh, be together with the nature. I, because I think we are facing a big challenge that we need to move from all kinds of criticisms, even myth criticisms, to eco criticism because we are killing nature and we are extremely related to animals and, and rivers and, and trees and they are sacred and they were gods. As you know, rivers and sea, the seas and the trees were sacred because we depend on them. So that's one of the sides of the power of myth that they show us what is or must be sacred and what we should take care of. We should take care of our animals and our nature and our, our water. And that's why I want to keep that. All right. So thank you very much for your answers. I think that you've provided very philosophical or often philosophical and thoughtful answers. Very interesting conversation. So thank you very much again. Yeah, you missed one question and it's important. Which one? The one that if there's something missing or that I'm missing and I'm missing my kid. 
my oh, my, yes. <laughs> my son Odiseo is always difficult to go away without my family but I know he is used to it and he's happy and that I hope that me pursuing my own dreams would be a lesson for him mm -hmm. to pursue his so I want to share or to ask all of your audience to pursue their dreams. <laughs>